his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life Jesus said to her I am the resurrection and the life the one who believes in me will live even though they die and whoever lives by believing in me will never die do you believe this Behold, I tell you a mystery, that we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. The last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall we come to pass with this saying, death is swallowed up in victory. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out and those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of the judgment he will wipe every tear from their eyes there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If I go away and prepare a place there, you may be also. Amen. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, we have come to the wake portion, a time of visitation with family in the celebration of Brother Lewis Barber Jr. And so this is an opportunity for you to visit with the family. It's an opportunity for you to share words of comfort and words of encouragement and just presence of encouragement. And at 1030, we will begin the celebration of Brother Lewis Barber. Amen.
blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of his glory divine. center of my joy, Jesus, you are the center of my joy, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Join, with, join me in a hand clap of praise for the life of Louis Barber. Today we've showed up here today. You all have showed up here today because Teddy, as you call him, touched your heart in a different way. And so today we are here to celebrate him. He has made an impact on all of your lives for you to be here on this Friday morning at 1030. So why don't we take some time to just celebrate his life? Come on, just celebrate his life in whatever way you would like to celebrate his life. Come on, celebrate his life. Come on, celebrate his life. Come on. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. 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 To see a father, a husband, a black man who was an example to so many and an encouragement to so many go home to be with the Lord, that is something to celebrate today. And so today we've come to celebrate. Have y'all come to celebrate or have y'all just come to sit? Uh, what did you come to do? Have you come to celebrate? Have you come to spectate? I hope you've come to celebrate because today is a celebration. Hey, Amen. I guess we got more spectators though. I said today is a celebration. Today is a celebration. It's already hard to be a black man in America, and we have a black man who had, was a father, a husband, and an, a great example in American society, and if anybody ought to celebrate, that ought to be us, right? Oh, Lord. All right, we have an order of service that we've come to follow, and really excited about this order of service because we have some really great things that are happening today the family has put together for us we're going to have a prayer by reverend george curry we'll have a selection um, by miss mrs ruth price rollins and then we have a scripture reading by deacon harlan booth and then our resolutions will be read and i'll come back after that good morning Scripture says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. They are comforted because we know, I'm sure we know where Brother Lewis Barber is at this moment. So let us pray. Father God, we come before you this morning to celebrate a life. We come before you this morning 
though heavy in heart, still able to rejoice for a life. Father God, we can rejoice in Teddy's life because you brought a certain kind of joy in him. Father God, it was you and the Holy Spirit that moved through him, that he brought joy to each and every member of the family. He brought joy to his friends. He just brought some kind of light to this world. He loved those because he knew you loved him. Father God, we just thank you because there is a promise in scripture that I can always come to you and ask for, and that's the promise of peace. So Father God, we ask that you wrap your arms around family members. We ask that you wrap your arms around friends, that you give them the kind of peace that is not even able to understand. We ask in those moments when we have a sad thought about Teddy, that we turn it around and you bring to us a kind of remembrance that will make us smile. There will be times when we just ask the question, why now? But what we need to ask and what we need to say is that one day we will see him again. Out of all the promises that he has given us, out of all the things that we can think of and rejoice in, that we can rejoice in, for he will be waiting for those who know you, and there'll be another celebration up in heaven. Father God, I ask that you give our pastor a, a word that will comfort the family as he comes forward and gives the eulogy. I ask that you just let the family stick together in such a way that from this point forward, they will lift up each other. They will be together. Father God, it's just great that you give us these moments to gather just to remember your children. So Father God, I just thank you. Thank you, thank you for the life of Lewis Barber Jr. In Jesus' name, amen.
everything I'm mine. Great is thy faithfulness. The one thing that I can say about this, this brother is my story. This is my song. As a part of the celebration, the family has chosen my my shepherd I shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures he leadeth me beside the still waters he restoreth my soul he leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff they comfort me Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. They've also chosen a New Testament scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And it reads as follows. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. We pray that these scriptures are comforting to the family. Good morning to everyone. This resolution is from the East Mount Zion Baptist Church. And the members, if you're able, will you stand? Resolution for Lewis C. Barber. John 10, 28 says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. In his own way and for his own purpose, God has called from our Miss Louis C. Barber. Brother Barber joined East Mount Zion on May 30th, 1965 and was baptized on June 10th, 1965. Therefore, be it resolved that Pastor Cash and the members of the East Mount Zion Baptist Church bow in humble submission to the will of an all-knowing and kind Heavenly Father. Death is a transition from gloom to glory. The gloom is this earthly veil of tears from which we shall all pass one day. The glory is the presence of Jesus, who died for us and yet lives. In the fellowship of this faith, we extend a loving hand of sympathy to his sister, Ingrid Blaylock, husband, Willie, and the other family members. 
We pray the Lord will bless you through the valley of the shadow of death with his rod for protection and his staff to guide you. Humbly submitted on this ninth day of June, 2023, by the East Mount Zion Baptist Church, the Reverend Dr. Brian A. Cash is our pastor. Brother Andrew Hatcher is the first chairman of Deacons, and Brother Thomas B. Harrington is the chairman of trustees. You may be seated. The family of Teddy Barber appreciates the time you devoted to them, time of, to their time of bereavement. Whether you simply thought about them, called, visited with them, brought food, gave other gifts, prayed for them, or personally attended, they sincerely thank you. At this time, the program calls for remarks. Um, Brother Al Drummer, Brother Peter Lawson Jones, Miss Robin Blaylock Appia. Did I say that right? Appia. I like that. Did I say it right, Appia? All right, great. So um, I'm going to ask that each of you do two minutes. Is that okay? Oh, man, thank you so much. Do you come right over here? And then those who will follow, I'm going to ask if you would just come on up and sit right on this front bench and in that order. Good morning. First giving unto the God who is the head of my life. To our Reverend Cash and other clergies in the house, and to the family and the friends, Ingrid Pat, y'all already know how me and Ted were. Ted was a great man. We talk. I gave these legends uh, picnics because we was all meeting like this at a funeral. So I stopped uh, and tell everybody, man, we need to meet on some happy occasion. So I formed the breakfast, and we started having these legend breakfasts last Friday of the month. Ted was always there, all the time. And then, a couple years, Corona set in, shut us down, but I found a way. You know, God made it happen. The old cell phone, we had 10, 15 of us on the phone, just talking, talking, keeping each other company and laughing. I know, Pat, when you were sitting in the background listening to us, you know, we had a good time. Ted was a good man. He was a good sportsman, basketball, football, baseball, track, bowling, and could he dance? Boy, he could dance and dress. We grew up on, uh, I grew up on 94th. Ted was on 95th. And uh, the whole area, we was all family. But Ted was a great man. And of anybody here from 94, 95, we call it the Anza Road Connection. Everybody, y'all stand up. Y'all grew up on 94, 95, Anza, Crawford, Huff Heights. That was us. Yeah, that was all of us. We had a great time over there. Yep, y'all stay standing because some, somebody today forgot to tell God, thank you. And we need to get up on our feet and give God a round of applause for waking us up this morning getting us on our way and letting us know Ted for how many years you knew him. Thank you for letting us know Ted. I called him Teddy Bear. I was giving my, my picnic, the last picnic that Friday, but that Thursday I talked to Ted on the phone. He called me because I had sent him a text and Ted, don't forget about the picnic. He called me back that night. He said, well, I ain't going to be able to make it. All I got to go to uh, Columbus for a bowling tournament. So, and the last thing he said on the phone, Ron Sanders, you back there? <laughs> Ron Sanders, he said, because him and Ron, we all friends on the phone going at it about who ran 95th Street. 
Ted was the senior man, so he told Ronnie he had to pay a fee to live on 95th. <laughs> so, so Ron was telling Ted, man, you owe me money. <laughs> I'm the young man now, but Ted, the last thing he said to me, he said, Al, get my money from Ronnie. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> That's what he said, man. Oh, man, Ted, we had fun, man. We had fun. Uh, I had wrote some stuff down, but I can't read it. <laughs> but, you know, as I viewed Ted's body today, I seen a little tattoo in there. Didn't know he had it. It said, return to sender. So God brought him here and God brought, took him back. Let's give Ted a round of applause. So he did his job. And I would, I would rather stand with God and be judged by the world than to stand with the world and be judged by God. Family, I love y'all. And y'all already know, Ted was a good man. We gonna miss him, but I know he probably wouldn't wanna come back. Once he got up there, he with all his family, his old buddy Scooter and Bub and Butch and Will Willingham, they, oh man, hand dancing kings. <laughs> So I just want to say I love y'all. God bless you. And peace. Reverend clergy, Pat, Ingrid, Andre, Stephen Carmen, Family and friends of Louis C. Barber, better known as Teddy. Uh, Pastor, I'm going to beg your indulgence because my remarks might extend a little bit beyond two minutes. So, I'm asking for your forgiveness already. You know, as we sit here today, gathered at this church, which Ingrid and Teddy and my maternal grandparents helped found, there are three things of which I'm certain. The one is I know that Teddy is now with our ancestors, with Leah and Duff Hoiston, with Stella Barber, with Uncle C, with my mom and dad of blessed memory. And I know that they're all resting in the loving embrace of the Lord. The second thing that I know is that if you didn't like Teddy, you were a fundamentally flawed sociopath. <laughs> because there's no way that you could not love this man. As generous and giving soul as there ever was. I know oftentimes when Lisa and my schedule might have gotten a little bit busy, and we needed somebody to maybe pick up Ryan or Leah or Evan, who we used to call the big fish because of his swimming ability. We knew, we didn't call Ghostbusters, we called Louis C. Barber to pick the kids up and deliver them where they had to go. And he always was so generous in setting aside the time, changing his schedule just to help out. That's the kind of human being he was. And the third thing I know is that this is, for all of us, a very surreal moment. It's, in some regards, unimaginable because of his energy, his aura, his being. I thought Teddy would live forever. And for, for me, Teddy, who was uh, four years almost to the day older than me, was more than a cousin. Closest thing that I had as an only child to a brother. Um, Ingrid and Teddy, my only first cousins that I have in the city of Cleveland, I don't have many first cousins at all, quite frankly. And some of my earliest memories are of the Barber and Jones family Thanksgiving 
uh, mom, dad, and I would always make a pilgrimage a few blocks away to uh, Aunt Stella and Uncle C's home, and we would have Thanksgiving dinner, always a sumptuous feast. And then Uncle C would sit in his chair, and the rest of us would sit around watching the football game together. Always the Detroit Lions always seemed to be on the menu. And then Teddy and I might sneak upstairs and play a game of electric football. To me, the greatest game ever invented. I don't know if any of you remember that, but you'd set up your players and then you'd turn on the electricity and the, that they would, the board would vibrate and the players would move. But then when it, your player got close to being tackled, you'd turn off the electricity and Teddy and I would just kind of tap the board a little bit until we knew whether to lateral, to pass, or just let the guy get tackled. You know, in some respects, I think Teddy knew me, he certainly knew me longer than I knew myself. I think he knew me better in some respects than I knew myself. I remembered, again, he, he was cool, very, very cool dude. And so I wanted to be like him and I wanted to hang with him. And he kind of sensed that the path that my life may have been on. And he said, no, Pete, it's, you don't need to come hang with me and my friends. Uh, you just go up there and finish your studies. That's the kind of protector he was and the kind of insight that he had into all of us as human beings. And Teddy knew some other things too. He knew he had an encyclopedia knowledge, a computer-like knowledge of music and sports. If any of you called him and left him a message, you knew you had to listen to a one or two minute snippet of music before you could even leave the message. And I would put his music collection of jazz, soul, R&B music up against the Smithsonian's, Motown's, or anybody else. Nobody could talk and knew, talk about it, knew more about sports and music than Teddy. There's one other thing I'd like to share, and it's often overlooked about my cousin, is the kind of perseverance and courage that he had. I can remember he suffered from epilepsy when he was younger. And I can remember, I think we were upstairs playing electric football and he had a seizure. He was terrified, I was terrified. I remember him calling for Aunt Stella. Now, you would think that somebody who struggled with that disease at an early age uh, might have become physically limited, but no, he went on to quarterback the East High Blue Bombers, left-handed quarterback. And then even though he struggled with adult asthma and, and CPD and, and uh, severe arthritis, you could count on him to be playing softball, to be bowling, to engage in all those kind of activities. He didn't let anything defeat him and keep him from doing what in his heart he knew he had a passion for doing. And, and, and in that respect, he has laid a template that we all should follow. Well, because I'm gonna miss our conversations, I'm, I think the last time I heard from him, uh, my wife and I were out of the country and he just called to see how we were doing and if we were enjoying ourselves. You know, I will uh, certainly miss watching Ingrid and him dance because that was art and living art to watch them so I always envied and wish I could dance like that. They were just so smooth. So that picture will be forever ingrained in my mind of the two of them, brother and sister, the hand dance king and queen of Cleveland. But the other thing I will miss is our little birthday routine that he and I had. His birthday was December 21st and I would call him and wish him a happy birthday. And then on December 23rd, he would call me often beating my wife and my kids to the task to wish me a happy birthday. So on uh, December 21st, this year and every year, I'm gonna pull out my phone I'm never going to erase his phone number from my contact list, and I'm going to call. 
And I'm going to wish him a happy heavenly birthday. Love you, cuz. God bless you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, just want to put it out there. Me following Peter Lawson Jones is a setup. Okay, just let you know. <clears throat> my name is Robin. These are my brothers, William, Michael, and Peter. And we are the nieces and nephew of Teddy. So um, <clears throat> we did write a little something down here to share with you all. We wanted to, um, we wanted to take this moment, you okay? Okay. We wanted to take this moment to tell the world what an awesome uncle Teddy was. He was wonderful to myself, my brothers, his children, unforgettable. He was a wonderful role model in our lives for as long as I can remember, always embracing us and giving us unconditional love. As a child, we have incredible fun memories of how Teddy would pick us up and take us to do various, activity, various activities. One of the most memorable um, activities that stands out to me is when he would take us to the arcade room. He would give us about $2. Back then, they were quarter things. It felt like a bucket of money to us. We would play all day, have a lot of fun, get out of our houses like these kids now to stay in their room playing games. But we got out and we just loved life. As we grew into be teenagers and started to drive, just wanted to get out there and drive that car and having nowhere to go, we wind up being at Teddy's house. <laughs> and inevitably, he out there throwing those steaks on the grill and that chicken on the grill, and he would always welcome us into his house with open arms. Steve, and Carmen, Jackie, and everybody, we had a great time. Now, if you really know Teddy, you know that one of the things he always loved was, like Peter said, his music. Over the years, I can recall, I can recall when he would visit me in D.C., and I would come home, he would always introduce, introduce me to new artists and new songs that he had just recently discovered. During one of Teddy's visits to D.C., because I live in D.C., one, one of his visits to D.C., he stumbled across his old school record store called The Road House, not too far from my house. From that point, it became a must-go-to spot every time Teddy came to visit. And then after that, it came into a must-stop that I had to make on my way home to drive to pick up some albums of records that he had pulled aside for me to bring home to him. I would complain to my mom, like, why I got to stop here and get these records? He's like, get those records for my brother. <laughs> But inevitably, it was great because I would come back to D.C. with a CD that he made for me, special for me, that I would drive all the way back and jam all the way home. So as we all became adults, and I think they can bear witness to this, what we learned was his unconditional love between Teddy and my, our mothers, Miss Ingrid. Their sibling bond, it was like what we used to call the superpower they had. Wherever you saw one, the other was never too far behind. I witnessed first, we all witnessed firsthand how Teddy and my mom embraced and supported each other's families and the friends. For example, whenever I invite my mom, dad, and everybody up for holidays, celebration, or anything like that, I inevitably knew I had to invite Teddy up, wanted to invite Teddy up, and have a space for him. My mom would say, oh, we're not having that. Teddy and family right there, too. That love and bond never ended. They were always together. And I would not be remiss not to mention their hand dance skills at all the gatherings. Everybody knew that Teddy and Mom could hand dance like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, but with a lot more soul. Teddy, Teddy armed with his superpowers, always demonstrated to much love, kindness, patience, forgiveness, and happiness to all. Watching Teddy and my mom, I learned, we all learned how to obtain these superpowers, and now we try to be like them. We try to love our friends, each other, keep open and accepting to all our love if they accept it. Uncle Teddy was more than an uncle. He was a role model, a mentor, and a true hero in our lives. His impact will be felt forever. His legacy of love, joy, will live in all of our hearts forever. I thank you all. You got two Amen. Y'all give them a hand. Yeah. This time we'll have a selection.
Following that, we will have the obituary read silently and then the eulogy.
join me in a word of prayer? God in heaven, we thank you because God, you are so awesome. Even in the midst of sadness and sorrow, God, you are still awesome because God, you are sovereign and you are in control. There is nothing that catches you off guard. There is nothing that causes you to be surprised. You are in control. You are so much in control, God, that you know what to give us in moments where we're not in control. In moments of sadness and sorrow and grief. So right now, Lord, I pray that you would open the eyes of the family to see the comfort and love that only you can provide. You are our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in the time of trouble. So we do not fear, nor do we worry, nor do we have lack of hope like those who do not have hope in you. We trust in you. We believe in you. We have faith in you. Right now, Lord, we pray that you would continue to encourage this waiting congregation and, more importantly, this family, this wife, these children, his siblings, this entire congregation to let us experience the love and the joy and the peace that only you can provide. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Family, I want you to just take a moment to look around. Take a moment to look around at all of the people that have showed up today. Lewis was loved, and we give God praise for that. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that. <clears throat> you all have done an awesome job eulogizing Lewis already, and so what I would like to do is just share a few words of encouragement from the 11th chapter of John. These words of John are inspired by a conversation uh, that I had with Miss Blaylock when I found out of the passing of Lewis. And I would like to share these words from my heart. John chapter 11, it says, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary, Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. Nor would happen for the glory of God so that the Son of God would receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going to go there again? Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is a danger of stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. And he had told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now, you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Thomas, nicknamed twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha in their loss. But Martha got worried, when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. Mary stayed in the house. 
Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Martha, in this particular scripture, is dealing with a lot. She's dealing with the loss of her brother, but she's also dealing with something we identify as unexpected occurrences. The death of Lazarus was not something that they expected to happen. Matter of fact, the sickness of Lazarus was not something they expected to happen. Scripture says that Jesus and the disciples get a report that Lazarus is sick. It has caught the people so off guard that John says that Lazarus is sick three times. Three times it is identified in the first few verses of 11th chapter of John, Lazarus is sick. And then it goes on to say Lazarus is very sick. The sickness of Lazarus really caught the entire community in Bethany off guard. It was unexpected. Lazarus was a dear friend of Jesus. Jesus, at this time, is probably 33 years old, and since Jesus is 33 years old, Lazarus more than likely is around the same age as Jesus. So his sickness was a surprise to the rest of the community. His sickness was so impactful that Lazarus did not live long with his sickness. He dies just a few days after the report gets to Jesus that Lazarus was sick. And so when Jesus finally shows up to the city of Bethany, Martha has a problem with Jesus. Martha looks at Jesus and says, I know you are a friend of ours, and I know you are the savior of the world, but if you would have been here, our brother would not have died. When the word gets to Jesus and the disciples that Lazarus is sick, Jesus says something that is shocking. He says, this sickness is not unto death, but this sickness is for the glory of God. It's shocking because this sickness for those who were in Bethany was unexpected and it was something that uh, rivet them so much that they had to send word, please get Jesus to come here because we did not expect this thing to happen so soon. Please, Jesus, if you would get here, Lazarus can be well. Sometimes that's what unexpected things happen and how that makes us feel when things happen and they are unexpected. It causes us to have a deep emotion of lack of control. If only I could do this, if only I can do that. When things come up, and they're unexpected, you're like, what in the world am I going to do? This is what's happening to Martha. But Jesus demonstrates to the 11th chapter of John that I am in control of things that catch you off guard. Things that you did not expect to happen, I already knew they were going to happen. Things that you were alarmed by, things that caught you off guard, I already had a plan for. All of us have had moments where unexpected things showed up and we didn't have an answer for it and we began to worry. Sickness and death are the biggest unexpected things that happens in our lives. Sometimes you cannot anticipate getting sick. And you definitely cannot anticipate when you're going to die. You know death is imminent. Because the Bible says a man born of a woman of a few days, those days are full of trouble. We know death is going to happen, but we just don't know when our day is going to happen. Death is an appointment we cannot cancel. Sickness is the very thing that catches us sometime off guard. But it doesn't catch God off guard. Jesus says this Sickness is not on the death because I already knew it was going to happen. And I am going to use this sickness to show the world that I'm in control. I began to think about this 
a few weeks ago, last week, when I got the call, we were in the funeral, we were having a funeral uh, that morning. And I get back into the office and I got a call from Ms. Blaylock that Lewis had passed. And Ms. Blaylock said something that caught me off a little off guard. She said, he, it was an unexpected death. That, that we knew he was sick, but the, the morning when he passed away, it caught us a little bit off guard. And, and then she began to say something that uh, kind of throw kind of took me on an, another direction. She said, since a child, Lewis had been sick. She said, since a child, Lewis had dealt with this illness and that illness. He even had to have something put in his heart. He had dealt with so many different illnesses all of his lives. And as she began to describe these particular sicknesses, I began to say, wow. Many of those sicknesses, other people have encountered and other people have died from. Many of these sicknesses that were described about Lewis were terminal sicknesses that other people have encountered one of these things and that one thing took them out. But since child, childhood, he experienced all of those sicknesses and still lived to the age of 70-something years old. And I, I began to think about that. I began to think about it because as you read the obituary that many of us may have kind of breezed over, how many of you looked at the obituary and saw the names of his sicknesses? How many of you looked at the obituary and saw all of the stuff that Lewis had to deal with? But how many of you looked at the obituary and saw that he loved to go bowling? How many of you looked at the obituary and saw that he liked dancing with his sister? How many of you looked at the obituary and saw all of the amazing things that he did in his life? Why is that significant? That's significant because the Lord is in control of what we're not in control of. I am the son of a mother who at 21 years old came down with chronic kidney failure. The doctor told her at 21, you will not see the age of 40 years old and you will never have any children. Well, mama just turned 60 something years old and she had two boys and three kidney transplants since the age of 21. D diseases that should have taken other folk, have taken other folk out, did not take her out. She's still alive. You know why? Because God is in control of things we don't have any control over. Jesus shows up and Martha is wrestling with the death of her brother. And she says, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But Martha didn't understand that Jesus did not need to be there to heal him. He, he could have just spoken a word and Lazarus would have been healed at that very moment. But he waited for this opportunity to happen to remind Martha that not only am I a God that heals the sick, but I am also the God of the resurrection. I am in control of everything. And I don't know who you are and where you've come from this morning, but I don't know what kind of unexpected things have hit your life this week or this year but I've showed up here to remind you God is in control of it all he's in so much control of it that he uses stuff that catches us off guard to build our faith so the next time something tries to catch you off guard, you look at the something and say something you don't have any power over me anymore because the God that delivered me from the past unexpected circumstance is the God that will deliver me in the new unexpected circumstance. And I wonder how many of you have showed up here and believe in affirmation that Lewis and us serve a God that he is in control over stuff we have no control over. But, but notice, Scripture says that Jesus says this sickness is not under death, demonstrating that he's in control of stuff we have no control over. 
But the God of the universe is so much in control of everything, but so intimate with everybody. Listen to the words of the scripture. If you had been here, our brother would not have died. And Jesus says then, show me where you laid him. Mary, the other sister, comes out. And when Mary comes out, Mary is the one who washed Jesus' feet with her hair. Mary puts Martha's words on repeat. She said, now if you would have been here, I can hear Mary saying it with a little bit more sass. If you would have been here. My brother would not have died. He says, show me where you lead him. And when they show him where Lazarus is, there are two words my grandma repeats at dinner and breakfast every day. Jesus wept. Jesus looks at Mary and Martha and the tomb and tears come down his eyes. This encouraged me, family. Because as great of control as God has of the world in his hands, he is not so much in control of everything that he doesn't have an intimate connection with everybody. He, he sees you when you cry. He sees the pain you're going through, Miss Patricia. He sees you walking through the journey of the valley of the shadow of death and it appears to be that you're all by yourself but he shows up and he says even when you can't see me I'm there. And I see you when you cry. I am not this God that just sits high but I am a God that also walks low. He cries with them. And isn't it amazing? To know that even when I feel disconnected from God, he's still connected with me. And, and this is a real caveat here because Lewis was baptized in the church in 1960. He was a part of one of the founding families of East Mount Zion. But Lewis, he didn't come to church every Sunday. He would come to church to sing in the choir. But Lewis understood, you ain't got to be in church to be connected to a God of the church. And I love this because what I love about God is even when I feel like I'm disconnected from him, he is never disconnected from me. Martha says, if you would have been here, and when Jesus shows up, he reminds Martha, Martha, even though my physical presence wasn't there, I was always connected with you. <laughs> That's why Paul says that there is nothing that separates us from the love of God. <laughs> not death, not sorrow, not pain, not tribulation, not sickness. Nothing separates us from the love of God. And it does not matter how you go in the world God is always connected with us no matter what pain we go through he's connected with us no matter what sorrow and problems we go through he is connected with us I, I have a six month old uh, I, I, I uh, saw the baby's not over there now baby uh, pawing at mama's face reminding me of my six month old river we have this app on our phone and that, that allows us to see River whenever he cries. And I'm surprised my phone ain't going off yet. Because whenever he cries, that thing goes off. Sometimes I'm in Bible study and, and that thing is going off. I'm in staff meeting and the phone is going off. But wherever he cries, I can always see. Now, uh, uh, Mama, my wife, took him to Atlanta with the grandparents. He's all the way uh, hundreds of miles away in their house in Johns Creek, Georgia. And last night at 2 a.m., my phone went off. And I could pick up the phone and see River crying. And the, the difference about me, daddy seeing River crying in Atlanta, I can't do nothing about River crying in Atlanta. 
I, I can try to call my wife and say, honey, what's going on? But I'm still a hundred miles away. I can't touch river. But you know the beautiful thing about God? God don't need no app to see when we cry. All God needs to do is just incline his ear to us. And the beautiful thing about God is when he sees us crying, Scripture tells us in Revelation that he then comes down and wipes every tear from our eyes. Uh, family, the days will get long. This beautiful aggregation of congregants who have come to support you will eventually foul out of this sanctuary. We will leave the cemetery and we will no longer see you every moment and every day. The cars and the cards and all of that stuff will slow down. But the beautiful thing about God is he never disconnects himself. And even when others leave us, he is always connected to us. Can you celebrate today? day that we serve a God that is always connected to us. I'm finished. The Bible says that Jesus walked over to the tomb and he says, Lazarus, come forth. Now, the beautiful thing about this is that Jesus tells Martha, I am the resurrection, <laughs> meaning I'm in control over what has control over you. <laughs> Nobody has ever been able to defeat death besides Jesus Christ. He's in control over death. He walks over to the grave, tells them to roll the stone away, and says, Lazarus, come forth. Amazing thing about God is God has a way of using something that seemingly has control over us and uses it to help us at the end. Death is that uncontrollable thing, but God uses it to transport us from this land to the other land. <laughs> he, he uses death, something so difficult to, as a transportation system that allows us to leave mortality to immortality. The beautiful thing about death is that when all of us experience death, we will not only leave here, to go somewhere, but we will leave here to go to someone. And when we leave here to go to someone, we'll see those who have left on this side. God has a beautiful thing about death, that even when we dis get disconnected from our loved ones, when we experience death, we will see them again. I, I'm, I'm finished, but my, I have not only have a six month old, but I, I have a crazy, one-year-old husky. Uh, it's a dog, y'all. Huskies are dogs. I got this crazy husky, and uh, if you don't run him three miles a day, he gonna run your house. And I can't have a dog running my house. So one day we took little Noah, uh, he ain't little no more, but we took Noah on a run with myself and one of the ministers. And as we were running, uh, the minister who was running with me was ahead of Noah and I. Uh, minister was here, Noah was here, and I was, of course, behind both of them. And we're trying to run and keep in pace, but when we got to the lake, the minister who was with us decided that he was going to go up a hill. And he left us. He said, I'm going to run up the hill. Will you go with me? I said, no, I had enough running on plane. I'm not running up that hill. And so I said, I'll meet you on the other side. But Noah didn't know that he was going to see the minister who he was tailing for three miles on the other side. So when the minister ran up the stairs, Noah couldn't run anymore because he had been running with this guy for at least three to four miles. And when he left us, Noah got all discombobulated. He looking around, trying to figure out where the minister is. And as soon as we got to the main street, Noah just stopped. He got on all fours, and he said to me in his own way, I ain't running no more until he comes back. <laughs> Noah didn't know that although the stairs went up in one direction, these stairs went down in the other direction. 
And when we stopped, he didn't realize that he was really at the base of where the minister was going to come down. And so when the minister came down the stairs, Noah started wagging his tail and started shaking and jumping because the one who had left him, he finally saw again. Well, the other day, Lewis left us. And although it puts heart and sorrow in our hearts, the good thing about God and death is we don't have to worry like Noah. We don't have to stop running the race like Noah. We can keep on running the race because sooner or later, no later than soon, God is going to crack the sky. And the Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise after the trumpet sounds and then we will meet him and them in the sky, in the air and we'll go and live with them eternally. God has a way of using things that seemingly are unexpected. Be encouraged this morning to lead us in the right direction. Lewis is in the place where he needs to be. Our job now is to continue to run the race until we see him again. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Pray with me, God in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for the life of Lewis. We thank you, God, for what he meant to this family, what he meant to this community what he meant to this world. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to lead and guide this family in the way that they should be. Continue to comfort, continue to encourage. God, we'll give you glory and we'll give you praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our funeral directors are coming at this time to give us instruction on what we are going to do from this moment. I'm going to ask as they come that those who have been identified as flower bearers uh, the ladies, our flower ladies, we're going to need you to come. We don't have many flowers, but we're going to ask those uh, who are able to come. Corey, how many do you want? Six? Seven. We need seven flower ladies. And after the flower ladies, I'm going to ask those who have been designated in the program to be pallbearers that you would guide yourselves up to this to the front and then our deacons are going to come and I'm going to ask that the pallbearers would lead behind follow behind our deacons and our ministers